Well, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker today. Pastor Jack Hibbs is the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel Chino Hills in California. He's the founder and president of Real Life Ministry, including the newly launched Real Life Network, which I'm sure he'll tell you about. Um, he's here with his wonderful wife, Lisa, and we're thrilled to have him ministering the word to us today. So please give a very warm welcome to Pastor Jack Hibbs. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Here you go. Thank you, Steve. How are you? You guys good? I was waiting, so this color leaves, that color leaves, and I feel like I'm supposed to say if you're over 12 years old, you can please stay. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Um, but it is an honor. It's a tremendous honor for us to be here, and it's very special for us, uh, also for Lisa and I. Uh, we've been in country for about a week, I would say, and um, just kind of relaxing, which is something that we don't often do, which is kind of shame on us, a little too busy. But um, we are going to be celebrating on next Friday, June 30th, 44 years of marriage. And, um, and uh, it's a miracle, believe me, it's a miracle. So, Father, we come before you and we ask, Lord, that you would bless the going forth of your word to our lives. We ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, not what Jack is saying, not what any of the speakers are saying. Father, we pray for a movement of your Spirit in this nation, starting right here in this place. As Pastor Steve and the team has been faithful to this Teach the Word conference, God, we pray that it would be a spark that would ignite not so much institutions or churches, but your people. We've learned, Lord, during COVID and all the things that have come since, it's not about an address, it's not about a name, it's not about a denomination or a movement. It is about you interfacing, as Spurgeon would say, intercoursing with the people of God. And so, Father, we pray that you would just do a tremendous thing that would be so powerful that it would skip across the pond to America and wake us up too. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. So listen, I'm going to stay true to the time because um, I need to. This is, if, it, if it was Calvary Chapel Chino Hills, I would pay no attention to the clock and that's the normal abuse that people get there. But um, so what we're going to be looking at, I have to tell you straight up, this is part one. And then later today will be part two of what we're talking about, what we're calling faith at war. No matter where you're at, no matter what denomination you're from, the fact of the matter is your faith is at war if you realize it or not. In fact, if you don't realize it, you're probably uh, falling victim to the fact that you are in the war, but you're losing because you're not aware of the fact that truth is under attack. Everything that you stand for is under attack. God's word is under attack. Uh, and by the way, have you noticed that everything in our world around us today is under attack and what's at the top of the list are the things that God has held sacred. Marriage under attack. Listen, family under attack. The word of God under attack. Church, we were in Bath the other day and somebody was trying to get money from us for a cause and they were telling us about the cause and it was a great cause. And, but I asked the question and I said, well, after you teach them all this stuff, What's the message you're giving them? What's the message? And he said, excuse me? I said, what's the message that you're putting on the inside of them? It's great to give someone a trade and to get them off the streets and to get them going, but what's the message? And he was puzzled, and I said, is this a Christian outreach? And he says, oh, no, no. <laughs> and he was all delighted to announce that it's not a Christian outreach. And, of course, I was offended by that, and so I didn't give him any of my my pounds. <laughs> and, um, but listen, there's so much going on in the world, and you've got to be aware, and I know that if you're here, you are aware of the fact that our faith is under attack, and when I say faith, I'm talking about the Bible, under attack. And I would submit to you today that Genesis chapter 1 is what Satan has gone after uh, with a fervor. And if you can establish your faith in Genesis chapter 1, you're going to be fine. Notice that 
even in the Christian community, there's the attack regarding God's ability to create. If your God cannot do whatever he wants to do in a matter of seconds or nanoseconds, then listen, you need to find yourself a new God. Right? If our God announces to us in the Bible, in the Old Testament, now I don't know how it is here in Europe and in England, but in America, there's a big movement right now among, watch my fingers, among churches to no longer teach the Old Testament because it's the Old Testament, they say. And you just need to uh, study parts of the New Testament. Listen, that's heretical. Because you have no idea if your New Testament's true at all unless you read your Old Testament. Did you know that? You got to know the old to know if the true is reporting on what was spoken about in the old. Faith is under attack. Faith is at war. And now today with all that's transpiring with transhumanism, I mean, Elon Musk, you've heard of him. He's going to be this year, by the way, this year, they are going to be able to implant in the human brain in the United States uh, this device that they've created that are going to allow people who were born blind, they've got all the parts, they've got the eyes, they've got all the parts, but they can't see. They're going to be giving people sight for the first time ever in human history. And that's the first step in transhumanism. But with all that's taking place, we were talking about this last night and this morning. What's happening in our world with faith under attack is that God's got to be removed. Your Bible's got to be removed. You need to be removed because you're of a completely odd world. But at the same time, the world wants to live forever. The world wants to be in control. And so now with AI and all that's going on, we are seeing man create man into deity in his own image. Man believes that now he can create a cyborg type of human heading in that direction that we don't need God. We're going to create the superhuman in our own image and that thing or that human or that whatever is going to be smarter than us, it's going to be faster than us, it's going to be better than us and we're hearing the debates today about how dangerous that is. Why is this even being talked about? Because faith is at war. And you and I are living in what I would call the days of deception, D-A-Z-E. People seem to be in a stupor these days. And I believe personally that the Bible's very clear, as we'll see in our reading together in a moment, that what's going on makes perfect sense from the Bible. It makes no sense any other way. If you don't know your Bible, you are either going to get sucked up into the narrative of what's happening, or if you know your Bible, you're going to see, man, it's incredible. It's incredible what's happening. And, um, well, we'll just dive into this. I want you guys to be aware as I get ready to read this. You and I live in a time when somebody says, well, we don't know that for sure. We don't know this for sure. If you mention something about Jesus, Christmas, resurrection from the dead, people will say, well, we don't know that for sure. You know the story about Jesus, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but have you noticed when the world wants to make their point or to somehow walk the political uh, correct line, they say things like this, and this is for real. Jake Tapper, don't know who, if you know who that is, but he's on CNN. He's one of their big guys. And he says, listen, and I'm quoting, we do not know what these series of train derailments of highly toxic chemicals are happening in America. That's going on right now. But we do know that there is no evidence linking these events to terrorism. When something happens, they say, listen, we just had this explosion take place. We don't know what's going on, but we know this. It's not terrorism. Have you noticed that? They, they, they don't know what's happening, but they know it's this. And they actually don't know it's that, but they're saying that to calm people down. I want you to know this, that when the Bible says what it has always said, it doesn't move, it doesn't change. It is true, period. The word of God. So it's not this thing where, oh, we're going to tell you this because that's what you need to hear, and we, we don't know what's going on, but we know it's not this, and most often it turns out to be the very thing that they're denying. Church, I want to encourage you that the very thing that the Bible has always said is true, but you and I now live in the 21st century to this moment, and it's not that the Bible becomes more true, it's always true. It's that you and I live here now at this time where the Bible's more clear more clear. I start with this. 
2 Timothy, I'm going to read a montage to you of scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 14. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. I think we're in them. For men will be lovers of themselves. So here's the qualifier. How do you know for in the last days? Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong. Can you believe this is 2,000 years old? Sounds like today's news. Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, Verse 5, for having a form of godliness but denying its power. Verse 12, pick it up there. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Verse 14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now watch, 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Boy, did we see this in a post-COVID world in America among those who professed faith. Verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And then finally, this is where we're going to make our argument from. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the wiles of the devil. Uh, For Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand or withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, take the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the word of the, or the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Verse 19. And for me, I love how Paul puts that in the end, for me, (laughs) that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Huge chunk of scripture. We won't be reading it for the rest of the day, but we'll be studying off from it. Keeping this in mind, marking this down, if you would, number one in our argument today, there'll be six of them total, three up front, three later this afternoon. Faith at war is this fact that we are in a spiritual battle in these last days, and you know it in this country as I know it in my country. You know it in your church as I know it in our church. Spiritual battles, recognizing this, number one, recognizing the unseen reality of the spiritual realm. Listen, everybody, the spiritual realm, if we are going to call ourselves Christians, that means Christ followers, we've got to recognize this, that we cannot function without recognizing the spiritual realm. Oh, but pastor, that gets kind of creepy. Of course it gets creepy. Well, people get kind of weird about that stuff. Of course they do. But listen, because of those things doesn't deny the fact that everything that you and I see in this world is being manipulated by spiritual invisible forces. Have we read our Bibles? Do we believe our Bibles? When the scripture tells us that we are raging a war and campaigning a war against spiritual darkness, it's not personal. Are there people in your life 
Are there people who you know, are there politicians, are there school teachers, are there family members? They're, they're, let's put it, put it nicely. They're not of God. I'm not saying that they are exactly of Satan, but I will say that if they're not of God, then they're being manipulated by the powers of darkness. And they're in your life. And for you and I to walk around and think, now look, you guys, I believe Jesus Christ not only can come back in this next moment, I hope he does come back in this next moment, but if he doesn't come back in this next moment, I'm supposed to fight darkness until he does come back. But fighting darkness is not fighting people, it's the powers behind them. Remember that. When you hear some crazy idea coming out of somebody's mouth, or listen, what we see in our countries about all of these issues about sexuality, do you understand? It's not personal. When I take a stand against this, I'm not attacking anybody. I'm going after the prophesied demonic powers that were spoken about in the Bible. I recognize that the agenda around the world that's taking place is to destroy the image bearers of God, and that's the human being. Satan hates you with a perfect hatred. He wants you destroyed. You say, well, I don't believe in him. He already got you then. That's like us in America. I, can't, I won't get into it now. I'll just simply say this. In America, it's clear to those who have their eyes open, we've been under attack for a long time. It's just that nobody recognizes it. Nobody says anything about it. And I think we're in a third world war in America. But the fact is, uh, there's no bombs going off, so it must be okay. This is a different kind of war. It mimics now more of a spiritual war than any other war that we've ever seen. So recognize this. Number one. Write it down if you would. The reality is powered by God. When Paul says to the church at Ephesus in, cha in chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Know this, that when we recognize the unseen reality of the spiritual realm that you and I are fighting against, we've got to realize that this reality is powered by God. It's empowered by God. It is, it is strengthened by God. Church family, you are not to fight these things that feel like they're crushing us. You're not to fight them in your own strength. You cannot do that. You'll give up. You'll become so discouraged. You'll look around and you'll, 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 you'll ask questions that will wind up being something that actually works against you rather than keeping your eyes on Jesus at all times. Oh, it's so dark. It's so hard to find fellow believers and it's so hard to find Bible teaching churches. This is true now globally. So instead of being discouraged, what does it mean? Hey, my Bible said there'd be days like this. This is exactly what my Bible talked about. And I don't need to be afraid and I don't need to be fearful because it's powered by God. You're alive right now at this moment because you are the brethren whom God has called at this time to fight in his power. Look, I walk around your city and this city and I look at all of these iconic things that I've read about in books. I see where these, these moments where the martyrs stood for the truth and it's absolutely epic. But listen, their generation is no different than ours except this, we're closer to the end. In a way, darkness was in your face back then. Now it's very subtle. I know this would never happen in England, but in America, you cannot drop your kid off at school anymore assuming that the school has your child's best interest in mind. The biggest exodus in America are parents pulling their kids out of schools. I don't know if you know that or not. It's huge what's happened, and for good reason. And people say, how can I do this? How can I do Powered by God. Do the right thing. When he says, finally, my brethren, what a beautiful, lofty thing it is for us to be brothers and sisters in Christ together. It's incredible. Be strong. That word is an absolute strength. It's, it's a, a strength that means immediately. It's being strong. It's be being strong. That's in him. And then that word power. It's a remarkable power. It's in the power that speaks about the dominions of territories. We talk about principalities and things like that, but municipalities where we talk about mayors and city councils or governors or whatever it might be, parliament and our Congress, these are people who are power brokers. So you ask yourself, whose power are they exercising? What agenda? There's two worlds in collision, not 10, not three, just two. And your great C.S. Lewis wrote so much about that. 
in mere Christianity, beautifully, like nobody else. But the power is of God. And he speaks to the Christian soldier here. Secondly, the reality is the realm of the Spirit, capital S. You and I are fighting in a spiritual realm. It's powered by God, but know this, that reality is the realm of the Holy Spirit. The greatest strength that you and I can have today is a great dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Look, I've already met many of you from various churches. I'll just ask you this. Is your church leadership, and are you guys being taught to be dependent upon the person of the Holy Spirit? It's the whole, think of this. Jesus was born into this world, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose again from the dead on the third day, ascended back to heaven, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down 2,000 years ago, and he's been with us ever since. <laughs> And you want to ask yourself, in your life and in your church's life, is there the manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power? And let me tell you what I think is the most important. Because I know in the body of Christ, there's all kinds of flavors and all that, and that's beautiful. The peripheral things, I'm not going to talk about. But when I read the book of Acts, the biggest, biggest deal about the Holy Spirit's power, it, moving beyond the fruit of the Spirit is the believer's ability to speak the word of God with boldness. Did you notice that? Well, pastor, I thought it was speaking in tongues. Listen, people dial down on that and they miss everything else. Well, I thought it was this. I thought it was... Listen, notice this, that the Bible says the Spirit came upon Peter and he spoke the word of God with boldness. It's the Holy Spirit's desire in your life, in this battle right now to fight like never before, but by his strength, by his power, by the Spirit, can I say it this way? By the Spirit of God possessing you. Either you're possessed by the Holy Spirit or you're vulnerable to the possession of something else. I know that's blunt, but uh, the Bible's very clear about this. Verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is absolutely awesome. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Listen, I don't know how good you are at wrestling. Depends on your temper and skill. You got to have both. You got to have skill. You got to have temper. None, uh, none of us can defeat the devil. We can't do it. If we could defeat the devil, then why did Jesus come? We can't defeat the devil. But with him, with him, he has to be defeated when we stand in him. Are you with me? When you see that it's not your abilities that's going to pull it off, it's not your strength and your connections that's going to pull it off, but the Spirit of God working in you. So whatever you come up against, Monday, you're going to go to work. You say, Pastor, you have no idea where I work. Uh, I think Satan works in the front office where, where I work. Maybe he does. Maybe it's his brother. Who knows? Here's the thing. The thing is this. Is the, it doesn't matter because we have throughout Scripture, we love so we love reading the Old Testament, and we love the great moments of great victories. We love Daniel in the lion's den, and we love Daniel not bowing to the statue. We love all that. We love David dealing with Goliath. But listen, can I say this? Please don't tell your kids that those are stories. Just stop now. Don't say it anymore. No more stories. Honey, let's sit down. Let's read this story about David and Goliath. Don't, don't say, say, honey, let's sit down and let's read how David took Goliath's head off. In fact, it's so cool. Listen, sweetheart, David used his sling. The rock hit the giant in the head, and he fell over. He wasn't even dead. Have you read the Bible carefully? David gets the sword and gets up on Goliath's chest and then drags the sword over Goliath's neck. That's not a story. I mean, Jack, that's graphic. Exactly, because it's not a story. David cut his head off, and that was, listen, David walked around for days carrying Goliath's head. And all the guys said, amen. amen. That's amazing. I mean, that's awesome. It's not a story. The part in the Red Sea is not a story. The Spirit of God was there. I refuse to believe in a God that does not show up for us. He's got to show up for us. It's never been this late before. We've never been closer to the end. We've seen perilous times and they're increasing. What do I do? What do you do? Stand up. This is an awesome time to stand up, but I don't think I can do that. Wake up. You can't. You cannot do it. The Spirit of God, listen, you show up, you show up, 
and you'll find him there. A lot of people, as Christians, sit back and they watch everything unfold, and then they kind of wonder, I don't see any power happening. Why should you? Well, I've never seen God move. Well, why would you? How could you? Have you ever signed up for anything? Have you ever stepped forward and said, Lord, here I am, send me? And you're trembling, right? He shows up in power. The Spirit of God will do that. He makes us able. And we can take great strength in that. He makes us able to stand. He makes us able to stand against. This word against in Greek is amazing. It means to be in motion from out of one place, like a local proximity, and to move toward another place. It's to stand against something, but in a military march, we would say, to advance toward the enemy. Christian, listen, are you guys all, can you hear me? As Christians, we are to be advancing toward the enemy, says the Bible right here in this verse. So if you know any, remember, we're not talking about people. We're not going after people. We're going after the demonic powers behind them. It's not personal. It's supernatural. So I'm going to read you two versions of the same verse, which to me, has been incredibly life-changing, and you're going to be shocked that it's even in the New Testament or in the Bible at all. Mark it down, please. It's 2 Corinthians 10, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 6. And this is the New King James Version, and then I'm going to show you um, a translation in a moment. But I want this to settle in. I want you to think about this. 2 Corinthians 6, 10. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. This is in the Bible. So what can that possibly mean? When's the last time you heard a sermon on this? Let's see it in the New Living Translation, which is a translation. If you have a New Living Translation, just know this. It's a translation. Get get yourself a real Bible, but you can still read that sometimes. This is a translation. It's not a Bible. It's a translation. Really, I'm serious. So look at what it says in the New Living. And after you have become fully obedient, we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. The reason why I gave you that is because that is actually very accurate. See, Jack, what are you talking about? Go around slap people doing evil? No. Stand up against evil. We are commanded to be salt and light, are we not? Have you read that before? Did did you guys sing this song? This little light of mine. Well, let me ask you, this little light of mine that we're supposed to shine, where are we not supposed to shine it? Can somebody tell me where we're not? You can't tell me where we're not to shine it. We're to shine the light of the truth everywhere. Everywhere. You may find this shocking, and and I find it shocking, but um, I happened to have been uh, a couple years ago in a a meeting, and uh, there was about 15 of us together, and it was in the White House, and President Trump walked in, we didn't know he was going to walk in. We were there for another meeting. President Trump walked in, and, he's, and he knew we were pastors. Somebody had told him. And you know Trump, he's like, I mean, he walks in the room. And it doesn't, doesn't matter what size the room is. When he walks in, the room's too small. He's just so big. And he walks in, and he goes, gentlemen, give those people that book. And that's, that was it. Give those people that book. I don't know what he knows about the book. But I know Satan doesn't want people to have the book. And it's got to be the book, the Bible, that is our strength and our foundation and what we're going up against in this world is guaranteed by the power of the Bible. And when it says that by our obedience we will punish disobedience, it doesn't mean we get in fistfights with people or yelling matches. It means when somebody says, you know what, we are going to resexualize your child. We are going to redefine their gender. And like, I hope it's not like this here, but the announcement is made, we know what's best for your child. They say this now to the mom and dad. Let me tell you something. If you don't stand up in righteous indignation to protect the littlest of these, then you'll never stand. You will never stand. What are you waiting for? Something bigger to come along? There's nothing bigger. Satan is after your life, after your family, after your world. And he's, 
He's telling lies. He's speaking things that you know is false coming out of people's mouths. And what has happened? So many times we cower back. We are supposed to speak up. And I know, it's, Jack, you're terrifying me. We stand when somebody says, this is the way that it is. Uh, there's, there's, this is the new definition of this thing. And you say, excuse me, but biologically, chemistry, historically, that's incorrect. History, science, biologists, chemists, doctors, physicists, it's one way. It's called science, and this is the deal. It's true. You've got the data behind you. Why? Because the God of creation is the God of truth. And the Bible in creation is perfectly, it's not going to contradict this big thing that we're in this day and age among young Christians. Well, you know, we believe in God, but we believe in science. And then you hear them define science, and it's not even scientific what they're defining. So that's not science. The truth will be activated in your life as you stand up and as you stand in the spirit of God, in the word of God. Thirdly, under this point, is the reality that is visible only to the believer. Do you feel like sometimes you're in crazy town? I'll just call it crazy town. It's like, am I the only one who thinks this? No, you're not the only one who thinks this. There's a bunch of us who think this. And when we take a look at what's happening, all this stuff should encourage you and I to realize, wow, my Bible is absolutely true. My Bible has anticipated all of this stuff. And listen to this. That we're to wrestle against, thank you, we're to, that, we're to, that we're to wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. <laughs> this is amazing. How do you do this? Against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So our battle's in the heavenly realms, and we are fighting against things that are invisible. Mere humans, how do we do this? By the power of God, by the word of God, by the spirit of God, and we wage war in the spirit. And when we stand up against that wickedness, these invisible powers are shaken. Please, please, let's start thinking this way more often, that when we go to pray, when we go to worship, you know what was beautiful? The worship team was up here doing their thing. You guys were singing, clapping. You know who wasn't singing and clapping? You guys were giving, you guys were giving hell a hard time this morning. Amen. They hate that. Think about that. It's one of the great reformers. I don't know if it was Luther or uh, who, it doesn't matter. Somebody said that Satan is so arrogant and proud that his proud spirit cannot stand to be mocked. Well, listen, Satan hates worship and praise. When you pray, you know, is it hard? Can you guys? I'll confess, I'm a long way from home. Prayer is hard. If I say, you know what, man, I can't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray today at 2 o'clock. Do you understand that by the time 2 o'clock arrives, every possible distraction will happen? Have you noticed that? Well, I don't know. Well, I tell you what. Make an appointment with God. Watch what happens. The moment you get on your knees, the phone's going to ring. Some relative that you've never even known is going to call you. That's how crazy it is. There'll be a knock at the door. Even though you don't know anybody, they'll show up. It's amazing. We're wrestling against things that are not of us. Not at all. And so we are in a very, very powerful campaign. And the reason why you're struggling in so many churches regarding the teaching of the word of God is because Satan is big on information warfare. Information warfare. So now we find out, which I don't know if you know this or not, but Alaska, the governor of Alaska, all the alarms went off regarding that Chinese balloon or balloons. Remember that? Did you guys get that story over here? And... Uh, they're saying, let's scramble our National Guard. You know, every state has their own Air Force. Let's scramble. Let's shoot this thing down. And, the, and the, the current administration said, no, no, no. And it floated across not only Alaska, not only Nebraska, Missouri, not only, and then it goes off the coast of uh, the Carolinas. And then they said, okay, shoot it down. No, I'm serious. <laughs> now we find out, we just found this out two weeks ago. That the data, that what was under the balloon was a, a, a type of technology that was receiving data from thousands of drones that citizens were flying around in their towns 
in their towns. They knew, listen, there were citizens that knew it was coming. They started flying their drones around certain areas. The data was being transmitted to that lower part of the balloon, transmitted straight back to China in real time. And they said that the information breach, because it went over our most sensitive military sites. You say, well, who cares? Who cares? Listen, information is more important than a nuclear bomb. Information. And you think Satan knows this. That's why Satan has churches that he runs. They, they, listen, he'll get those churches a little bit off of this topic, a little bit off of this doctrine. You know, people want to shy away from doctrine. Friends don't ever shy away from Bible doctrine, ever. It's the only thing you have. Well, you know, we're not going to talk about those things because um, it makes people upset. It's supposed to make people upset. <laughs> well, we don't want to bring that up because it, it causes division. Spurgeon said there's blessed subtractions in your church. Isn't that a great word? <laughs> Listen, so I'm not, I'm not saying to, to do this to, to cause uh, uprising. What I'm saying is speak the truth. Jesus is my, my sheep, hear my voice, they follow me. Speak the truth. And then what happens is God begins to weed out the tares from the wheat. And we're living in an age where truth is being sacrificed on a lot of churches' altars every Sunday for unity. Watch this. We're, 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 it's all about unity. And you want to really upset them? Unity. Thank you. Great. Unity. I believe in unity. Unity around what? What are, we, what are we unifying behind? I'd love to know. Well, that you can believe in all this stuff. It doesn't matter what it is. And, you know, if it's good for you, it's your truth. It's his truth, my truth. It's... That's why there's Bible doctrine, people. And just for me saying what I'm saying right now, I could be thrown out of some churches in America. Because it's considered divisive. Information warfare, Satan is a master at it. I want to run through this very, very fast. I want to keep true to the time. Confusion results in division, which results in fear, which leads to panic, which leads to bad decision making, which leads to tragic conclusions, which leads to bondage, which leads to despair, which leads to hopelessness, which leads to death. That's the pathology of not embracing the truth. Second point today is this, responding to the varying threats that are around us as believers. And the first thing is this, and uh, sadly, we all know what it is, but then at the same time, we can be encouraged by this. When the Bible says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Imagine yourself now just suited up in armor as a believer, spiritually speaking, and you are actually engaged in this cultural war for Christ, and you're Standing in the truth, you're, again, all suited up. The suit that you're wearing keeps you in mind that you're in a battle, that you realize this, that if we are not suited up in the whole armor of God, this is one of the things that will manifest, and that is that the enemy's war is to silence the human spirit, to cause you to be silent. The enemy's warfare tactic is to control the information Satan wants to control what you're hearing and he wants to get you to be silent. To, to be silenced. Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you will prosper and every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me says the Lord. Is that beautiful? Joshua 1, verse 5 and 6. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and of good courage. When we lose courage, we're silenced. We are either silenced by not saying anything or we're silenced by saying something that's not true to, so to speak, keep, this, keep the peace. But one of the most wonderful things ever, the most disruptive, can you imagine Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and says, Jesus, we know that you're a mighty man come from God for no man can do the miracles that you do. Did Jesus say thank you? Thank you, Nick, for recognizing that. Oh, that's great. Finally, somebody appreciates what I'm doing. He didn't say that. <laughs> he didn't say that. What he, what he did was, what he, oh, I'm, th I'm just melting. I, you don't, there's not enough paper. Um, <laughs> Jesus says, uh, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. 
Silence in the pulpit, to me, is unforgivable. Because during COVID, people started coming to our church, and I would teach a message, and then they would stop me in the courtyard and say, did you, did I hear you say that you said that Jesus is physically, literally coming back to earth someday? To establish his kingdom for a thousand years? Did you say that? I go, yes, I said that. We read it today in the scripture. Are you new here? Yes. But I've been going to church for 25 years at XYZ Church. We've never, we were told that this is all an uh, uh, analogy. It's, it's allegorical. Oh, my goodness. Listen, I, I, I don't think God sent COVID, but I think God used COVID. And what did we find out? Pastors in the pulpit. I don't care how many degrees they have hanging on their arms. They wouldn't speak. And people would come to church, we'd open up the Bible, and we'd study the Bible, they'd start crying. And it reminded me of the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Remarkable. Cannot be silent. Second thing is this, the enemy's war to confuse us. The enemy's at war to confuse you and I. Everything around this world of ours, you guys are the only ones speaking the truth and you're not confused. But you feel isolated. You, you feel like nobody's listening. Imagine what Jeremiah felt like. Church, we're in great company. We've all, for those of us who have been Christians for a while, we're so excited that these are the last days, but we thought they'd go out a little easier. We thought that, you know, we'd get raptured and then it all would fall apart. No, it's all falling apart now. And here's my, here's my thing. If Jesus doesn't come back soon, it's not going to be a surprise. It's so obvious. <laughs> right? Think about that. This is going on. Wars and rumors of wars. Uh, global currency. Uh, all of these, you know, let's tear down the borders. Let's all become one. Wow. That shouldn't freak you out. And it shouldn't confuse you. Thirdly, under this, is that the enemy's war is to destroy the human body. And I touched on that at the beginning. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. And I don't want to belabor it. I can't do that. But it's this. A absolutely uh, hell-bent Satan is to destroy the human body. And you can just meditate on that for the moment. You, uh, destroy the human body by diet. Destroy the human body by manipulation. Destroy the human body by perversion. Look, in this culture of ours, I hope it's not like it is in America, especially in Southern California. In Southern California, it seems like every corner there is a plastic surgeon. Why? Because nobody's happy with their body. Everybody's trying to change themselves. Why? Because they're looking at themselves and they're seeing that it's all about my body. Friends, it's not about your body. Your best body's coming later. Aren't you glad? Everybody over 60, say amen. Yeah. First thing I did this morning, I got up and I said, Lisa, where's the Advil? <laughs> where's the ibuprofen? <laughs> and then this, I'll do this. I got two minutes and we'll do the third and final point. And that is resisting the coming of darkness. Oh boy. When he says to gird up the waist with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Church family, listen to this. You and I are to be resisting the coming darkness. You said, Jack, wait a minute, you're confusing me because you just said that God's word tells us it's going to get bad. That's exactly true. But nowhere does God's word tell you to go sit on the sidelines and wait it out. Maybe you're here today and, for example, you don't believe in the imminent coming of Christ. You've somehow missed that. Some people would say, and they say it to me, I can't believe this. You're involved in this, and you're involved in that, and you guys are doing this, and you guys are doing that. Don't you believe Christ is coming back any moment? That's what you say. Yes, I do. Well, then why are you doing it? You're making these plans for the next 50 years. That's right. It's called Occupy Till I Come. People who say, no, you, you Christians, you, you, you're hanging on to the rapture because you want to escape. Okay, well, first of all, the Bible says in Luke 21, 36, Pray that when he comes, you'll be able to escape. So there's nothing wrong with escaping. If you're in a, if you're in a bad place, escape. Okay, but until you're gone, the Bible is very clear that you and I are supposed to fight for what's right. Every single one of us, in whatever area that you and I could possibly show the influence of Christ from a biblical worldview, we are to do that. 
And so just mark this down. We're to fight from the position of protection. You're suited up in the word of God. Do you know it? The more Bible you have, the more protected you'll be. The more Bible you have, the more protected you'll be. Notice that in all of your great biblical examples, these men and women of God who fought battles, I throw women of God, you see women, Deborah, every time they fought a battle, they were stronger on the other end. Only the Christian can say that. When you go through this thing in life, it's very difficult and challenging. God comes through, now you're stronger. And somehow that's going to equate into eternity. But just know this. We are absolutely protected by the hand of God. Why do we play it so safe? Then the world out there, in our hotel room, I don't know why, but in our hotel room, in the bathroom, there's a guy jumping off a bridge with a bungee cord. What kind of decor is that? I don't know what that means. But he's like this with a bungee cord, jumping off a bridge, and uh, that's the time to stop. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, So I I was thinking it should have been a trumpet blast, right? So you guys wrapping this up, this the world the world is seeking a thrill. Men go down in a in a rinky dink submarine to go see the Titanic. Why, 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 why? A thrill! A thrill. Jumping off of bridges with a rubber band on your foot. Thrill. I want the thrill. You want a thrill. You want a thrill? Become a Christ follower. Okay? First of all, there's nothing that can compare with being a committed Christian. Nothing. But know this. It's a war. It's a battle. And it's this. The reason why we're at war, friends, is because we fight representing our king, and our king is righteous. And I know that you and I are not in ourselves, but in his righteousness we are. So that when something, when the alarm goes off, the Holy Spirit says, that's wrong. What you're supposed to say is, excuse me, but we can't have this happen in our community. It's not right. The number one temptation that comes to us is that's for someone else to do. But listen, friends, I leave you with this. When God shows you something that is troublesome and you know it's troublesome from the word of God and it rings true to your spirit, he showed it to you, not your neighbor. Why doesn't somebody do something? He's already asked you to do it. Does it make sense? And then I end, I really end, look, I'm ending. We as believers are to always be moving forward in the faith, never going backwards. I thank God. Church, you guys, with what happened in a COVID world in Southern California, We baptized on, we had to take three Saturdays and we baptized 3,014 people in three Saturdays because of people realizing I need God in this world. I need Christ in my life. I need the forgiveness of God, the cross, the empty tomb. I need need what everything he has to offer, I need because nothing in this world is making sense. If nothing in this world is making sense, You need him because thank God you realize there's something very, very wrong because so many people think things are really, really great. You see the light and to see the light, you can compare that light against the darkness. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would descend upon each of these that are here today by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father God, to fill them, to cause them to be overflowing vessels of your will and of your truth and of your power. And Lord, may you anoint every single one of these believers to wage war against the kingdom of darkness because it's a battle already settled in heaven. Hallelujah for that. Thank you, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.